fans on the pitch here in the six-yard area. The referee's going to have to stop the game. Tonight, new evidence about the cover-up over Hillsborough. It was decided very early on, this is the way it's going to go. We can't possibly be blamed, the police can't possibly be blamed. With a new inquest ordered, pictures never before broadcast reveal how Britain's worst sporting disaster was allowed to happen. It's on news, boys. It's all on news now. You are the eyes of the world. You've got to show this to everybody. But the full story wasn't told, and the truth was buried for a generation. It was cut out by a public servant who didn't want the rest of the world to see that evidence. It is a disgrace. Some witnesses were leaned on. They've got their story straight. If you keep talking in this way, it's not going to do you any good. Others were discredited. He'd never been described as naive before. In fact, he'd always been described as a very astute uh, man with a great deal of integrity. It's a scandal that taints the political establishment. I didn't get this thing right. I got it wrong. Uh, and I can't turn the clock back. And justice was denied to the families of 96 people who died. They used to say, you're right, Anne, but you'll not beat the system. How could anybody, as a decent human being, put people through nearly 24 years and they knew? I've been following Liverpool Football Club all my life. I've watched them grow to become one of the world's biggest clubs with an international following. As a fan, the excitement you get from being at the match is hard to beat. We were just as keen back in the 1980s. On the day, we all went over to Sheffield for another big match, an FA Cup semi-final. Hillsborough, Sheffield, April the 15th, 1989. Liverpool had asked for more space at the ground because they had more supporters than the opposition, Nottingham Forest. But on the advice of South Yorkshire police, the FA turned them down. So 24,000 of us were squeezed into the bottleneck, which was our entrance on Leppings Lane. There was a mass of people outside the ground, couldn't see the turnstiles and didn't really see any of the police and I was quite shocked. Stephanie was 18, going to her first away game with her older brother Richard and his girlfriend Tracy. I thought well, maybe this is what it's like, maybe it's just good policing at Liverpool ground, I don't know because I'd not been away before. It wasn't only fans like Stephanie who were concerned. I was surprised at the lack of police officers at the end of the ground. PC Ray Powell was on plain clothes duty in the crowd that day. There'd normally be more policemen forming queues, making sure there was order. Normally there would be a little bit more of a, of a, of a, of a police presence there. Inside, the ground was full behind the goals. The BBC's John Motson was rehearsing for that night's match of the day. It was 2.41. Liverpool's faithful followers, fed on success for 25 years, are at the Leppings Lane end. They have 24,000 tickets and haven't seen their team lose since New Year's Day. The match commander was based in the police control box. Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield had never before handled a big game. He had a good view of the Leppings Lane end, and so did John Watson. There's gaps, you know, in parts of the ground. Well, you look at the Liverpool end to the right of the goal. There's hardly anybody on those steps. No, to the right of there, that's it. Look down there. Back then, supporters stood behind the goals. The terrace divided into pens for crowd control. 
but the police didn't direct fans into separate pens to avoid overcrowding. They were left to find their own level. It must have taken me 20 minutes to escape the crush outside, but once through the turnstiles, I was safe with a seat alongside the pitch in the north stand. Jenny Hicks was in that stand too. She'd driven up from London with her husband and two daughters. They'd gone to stand on the Leppings Lane Terrace. You can just glimpse the girls, Sarah and Vicky, right behind the gold as the Liverpool teams announced. It was getting more and more crowded. And I started to become quite uncomfortable about it, uh, knowing that my family could be there, because I couldn't see them on the sides. Her husband, Trevor, was in fact standing in a side pen. He too began to worry as the crush behind the goal got worse. I was looking over and starting to get anxious about Sarah and Vicky. I have a very vivid picture of an oldish guy, my sort of age <laughs> now, in a grey suit with grey hair pinned up against the radial fence, looking very distressed. After being told that lives were at risk outside, Chief Superintendent Duckenfield gave the order to open Gate C, a large exit gate. Stephanie Jones, her brother Richard and his girlfriend Tracy headed for Gate C. We can just pick them out on police CCTV. We were getting crushed outside. So when it was opened, we went through it into the clearing. And then just proceeded at a, a normal walk down in front of us, the only way we could see down the tunnel. In the past, when the central pens were full, police had closed off the tunnel and diverted supporters to the side pens. Not today. 2,000 poured through the gate onto the already overcrowded terraces. The momentum took us forward, and in a very short space of time, I found myself turned around and right at the very front. Tracy had lost a shoe, and um, I couldn't reach her. Um, somebody picked up her shoe and picked her up as well, because she'd fallen, and that was the last time I saw either of them. Even before the game kicked off, people were dying on the terraces. The only way out for fans crushed against the wall and fencing at the front was through a small locked gate onto the pitch, one for each pen. I remember us shouting to the police members by the gate and we were asking them to open the gate to take the pressure off. He was standing there looking at it and he's just basically ignoring us and people are screaming at him to open the gate. People began climbing the fences in desperation. But the police, who could see it all from the control box, assumed it was crowd trouble. I saw people being pushed back over. By the police? By the police, yeah. People were trying to get out and they were being pushed back in. Hillsborough was a disaster like no other. It was recorded by eight BBC cameras. The police had CCTV and a mobile camera unit. The BBC footage was later released to the police and the family's lawyers, and then locked away, considered too distressing for broadcast. 24 years on, we've been able to analyse it. It shows how things went wrong from the start at Hillsborough, and continued going wrong for longer than has ever been admitted. Clear sunny day in Hillsborough. The stage is set for a rerun of last year's classic. Liverpool in red, Forest all in white. Stuart Pearce gives away the first free kick. By now, police officers at the Leppings Lane end had opened the gates behind the goal and were escorting fans to the sides. But the gates were too small to get people out quickly. 
dozens were trapped at the front, many of them youngsters. I was very distressed at this stage because I couldn't move. I was face to face with a man um, who was obviously in trouble as well. I think there may be a slight overflow in the crowd at the Liverpool end, at the Leppings Lane uh, end of the ground. But there is room in the sections to either side if they can uh, shift them over. But police control still feared a pitch invasion and ordered up reinforcements, even as the first injured fans spilled onto the pitch. And there are fans on the pitch here in the six-yard area. The referee's going to have to stop the game. Just before six minutes past three, the game is stopped. Fans run onto the pitch, yelling for help. Some were in shock, like Stephanie Jones. Fortunately for me, I'd found myself in front of the perimeter gate. And somebody said to me, through here. I've no idea how it happened. I don't know how they've hugged me up or pulled me up but they pulled me through the perimeter gate and I was probably the first person they pulled out of that gate onto the pitch. Steve Nichol is trying to urge the fans to go back and they're saying there's no room. Back on Merseyside, those with family at the game soon heard news of a problem at Hillsborough. Among them, Stephanie's mother. I had a look at the television which was on the commentator's voice was very, very serious and he thought there was injuries and maybe a fatality in there. And I just started screaming right away. My three are in there. Police commanders were slow to react. The FA's head of communications, Glenn Curtin, went to the control box to find out what was going on. Mr. Duckinfield said that there'd been a break-in at one of the gates caused by an, an inrush of Liverpool supporters. A break-in? Yes. Already, the blame for Hillsborough was being shifted onto the fans. Within minutes of the game being stopped, John Motson heard the story. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got an explanation for what's happened here, VT. I'm going to give you a line. And the story emerges that one of the outside gates leading into that terrace was broken. People without tickets got in, were therefore overcrowding the people with tickets, and that's why the crush occurred. Supporters who'd escaped the crush did what they could to help the others. They ended up getting pulled through the gate, and they jumped up on the fence trying to pull people up, but it was virtually impossible to pull them out because the fences were designed to keep you in, basically. Fans and police tore at the fence to get to the injured trapped against the wall. In the seats above the Leppings Lane Terrace, Dr John Ashton was with his two sons. I saw people being carried onto the pitch and I turned to one of my boys and I said, I think that person's dead. And then there was another one and I said, I think that one may be dead too and that one. The police should have activated the major incident plan for all the emergency services to swing into action. But they didn't. So the first ambulance on the scene was from the St John's Ambulance Volunteers. Its arrival time, 3.15, was significant. A coroner would later rule that all of those who died were by then either already dead or beyond saving. I went and made myself known to a policeman and said, what should I do? He had no idea. And I realised that there was nobody actually taking charge. I did what I could, which was not really about applying first aid or anything. It was about trying to get the right people off to hospital in the right order. When a second ambulance arrived at the other end of the ground, Liverpool supporters carried victims across the pitch on advertising hoardings. Among them was an off-duty fireman. I just noticed people were putting people on the boards and trying to ferry them across the pitch as quick as they can. And I think I've done that um, two or three times. 
it was trying to look for people who needed help and basically going from one person to another, trying to do some basic first aid. Trevor Hicks was looking for his two daughters. I went onto the pitch very quickly and quite remarkably found Sarah and Vicky almost side by side. So suddenly here I am with both daughters and we're fighting to save their lives. Ambulances arrived outside the ground, but crews and emergency equipment weren't sent inside. Only one more ambulance drove onto the pitch. The ambulance man on board this third vehicle says the emergency response was chaotic. I always think in terms of a rail accident. Could you imagine the public outcry if all ambulance crews remained on an embankment simply because they couldn't get the ambulance down to the scene of the, of the accident? That doesn't happen. They get out of their vehicles, and if that's the length of a football pitch that they have to go, then they make their way there. Alongside the grief and the shock, there was already anger at what had been allowed to happen at Hillsborough. They opened the gates, never even took the stub, just opened the gates. Said Disgusting. all piling. There's at least 50 people dead tonight. The fans who were mercifully not injured have left the ground, most of them. And the feeling here now is one of complete numbness. We were sitting on the coach and nobody was speaking. And I couldn't stop shaking. And then driver put the radio on and then it, it come out it was like 16 dead and then we obviously we were waiting for people to come back and and the numbers just kept going up and up and up much worse was to come for the relatives of those unaccounted for the football club gym was now a temporary mortuary Trevor and Jenny Hicks arrived knowing their 15-year-old daughter Vicky had died in hospital. 19-year-old Sarah was still missing. Inside were dozens of bodies to be identified. The police had taken pictures of them all. Trevor and Jenny were asked if their daughters were among them. There must have been 80-odd photographs, little Polaroid ones. And I looked and I couldn't see Sarah. I recognised Vicky. So, so the policeman just said to me, look again, love. And when I looked again, I saw her. And that was the point I knew it was both of them. Many families were now arriving from Merseyside. Doreen and Leslie Jones knew their daughter Steph was safe, but their son Richard and his girlfriend Tracy were missing. They wheeled the trolley in, and Richard was the first one who brought, he brought it in. And I identified him, and then Tracy was wheeled in, and I identified her. I wanted to touch my son. I wanted to hold him, and I wasn't allowed to. We were told he was the property of the coroner and that uh, I couldn't touch him. Among the officers helping to identify the dead at the gym was PC Ray Powell. That night I cried. I went to and I cried. And I wasn't crying for myself, I was crying for the relatives of the people the only thing I remember about the gymnasium, apart from, you know, the section off, was a fella punching the brick wall. And it was like, you know, new brick, which was sharp. And he was punching it. And nobody took any bloody notice. It was disgraceful. That night at South Yorkshire Police Headquarters, the Chief Constable, Peter Wright, was in no mood to accept any blame for the disaster. But he corrected the false story that Liverpool fans had caused it by forcing open a gate. 
the gate, the gate was opened at police direction. I am not aware of any connection between the opening of the gate and the surge on the terrace. Why was the gate open to you? Because there was danger to life outside with, with crushing. How did it get that bad? By late arrival of large numbers of people. 93 football fans, most if not all Liverpool supporters, have been crushed to death at the FA Cup semi-final at Sheffield... By 10 o'clock, it was clear to thousands of us who'd been there what was to blame. Overcrowding and poor policing had caused the disaster, which is what I reported that night. Those of us who were trying to get in, into the Leppings Lane end of the ground, the Liverpool end, were quite perturbed and angered at the lack of adequate policing, uh, which led to dreadful crushes outside, which in turn led to the police opening the double gate. What we didn't know back in 1989 was that a cover-up had already begun. It lasted almost a quarter of a century until last September, when the Hillsborough Independent Panel published the results of years of research. What we have here, 23 years of contemporaneous documents, stage by stage, which has gone through a forensic analysis at all levels. The secrets of Hillsborough are contained here in the Sheffield Archive. There are nearly half a million pages from confidential police, legal and government documents. The records of inquiries, inquests and hearings. They show the disaster was never properly investigated. It's meant that those at fault have been able to shift the blame onto others. These documents are now the starting point for our investigation into how and why that was allowed to happen. Before the victims were identified, the coroner had ordered blood alcohol tests on them all, including children. False allegations of drunkenness would be used again and again. The morning after, the Prime Minister arrives to be briefed by officers, including Chief Superintendent Duckenfield, the man who lied about the gate. She was told a tanked up mob had charged onto the terraces. Chief Constable Wright was privately calling the Liverpool fans animalistic. We shall find all of the facts through an inquiry, and well, you mustn't make any judgment on partial facts. That weekend, South Yorkshire police were developing plans to defend themselves. Senior officers were then called to a meeting. Among them was Inspector Clive Davis and his boss, a man whose role was to become increasingly controversial as the years went by. I was working with a senior officer at that time. It was uh, uh, Chief Inspector Norman Betterson I was working with. He said he was keen for us to go to a briefing. This is an opportunity for us to get ourselves recognised. That, that, those were his words to me. At the meeting, Clive Davis, Norman Bedison and other officers heard the South Yorkshire Police strategy spelt out. I think the exact words, and they are almost indelibly stamped on my memory, uh, we're going to put the blame for this where it deserves to be, or where, where it should be, on the drunken, ticketless Liverpool supporters. And we have to go now and find the evidence to, to, make, to, to show that this is the case. It was a message that could stick. In the 1980s, there was regular violence among football crowds. Liverpool's reputation hadn't been particularly bad. But in 1985, 39 people were killed fleeing Liverpool fans during fighting at the Hazel Stadium in Brussels. Now Sheffield's Police Federation, backed by their chief constable, were blaming Liverpool fans for Hillsborough. When you've got great big police horses there, and I don't know about you, but they frighten me to death, and they're diving under the belly and between its legs. Now, anybody who does that 
I don't care what other people say, they're either mental or they're drunk. The police federation and senior officers were feeding these lines to journalists. The lie became the truth, with parts of the press ready to swallow it whole. You've no idea how much that has followed me over the years and how much that has deeply, deeply hurt me over the years that people could think they're virtually blaming me for killing my own brother and his girlfriend. It was decided very early on, this is the way it's going to go, we can't possibly be blamed, the police can't possibly be blamed. According to the Police Federation today, their role in spreading those stories was understandable. I think what the Federation rep did was report what had been told to him in the immediate aftermath of a tragedy. A lot of the people there will see and will have seen and heard bad things and they report them either exaggerated, over-exaggerated, whatever it may be, and it becomes their truth. Is that reasonable? It may have been reasonable at the time. Whether it looks reasonable looking back at over a, a distance of time is a different, uh, different story. The week after the disaster, Liverpool's Anfield Stadium had become a shrine. Among the thousands paying their respects was the man chosen to find out what had gone wrong at Hillsborough. This scene is a most poignant and moving one, which makes one realise how deeply this community has been uh, afflicted and how deeply it feels its loss. Lord Justice Taylor was to lead an independent inquiry. The government had asked for an urgent report. Alongside him was the West Midlands Chief Constable, Geoffrey Deer. His force was to investigate where the blame lay. But South Yorkshire police, who were under investigation, were handed a trump card. Lord Justice Taylor allowed them to take their own officers' statements. He decided, and I fully supported him, that one way to move through quickly was to ask the police witnesses, not, not those who were uh, likely to be in the frame for criminal prosecutions, but the police witnesses to write their own statements. The ordinary officers on the ground, basically. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and that's what they did. He wanted it done that way. He saw that was the quick way through his decision. I'll take responsibility for it, because he's dead. But that was his responsibility at the time. And, and, and here's a man who's going to become Lord Chief Justice. I mean, it's not for you or I to, 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 to query that, I would suggest. South Yorkshire police officers on duty that day were instructed not to make witness statements in the usual way. Instead, they were told to write down their recollections on plain paper. There is absolutely no reason at all why all those police officers shouldn't have been told write witness statements in the conventional way about this in the same way that all the Liverpool supporters who were interviewed by the West Midlands police did. The police officers' first accounts were then vetted and many were altered and edited by senior officers before being signed. PC Brian Huckstep had originally written it might possibly have been better to direct the fans into the flank areas, which I saw were by no means full. That was cut out. PC Andrew Brooks had a question. Why were the sliding doors at the back of the tunnel not closed at 2.45, when those sections of the ground were full? That went. Critical comments were deleted from no fewer than 116 police statements. The process was to contaminate all future legal proceedings. There was a clear pattern right from the outset that any criticisms of senior officers, any criticisms of the policing operation were removed in their entirety, any criticisms of the fans were left in. PC Ray Powell had expressed concerns at how few police he'd seen at the turnstiles outside Leppings Lane. The first thing I said was, where are all the bobbies? There's hardly anybody there. There was usually a large police presence on this part of the ground, usually forming some sort of cordon. That and more was erased. You didn't realise what they'd done? No, as such, I, I wasn't aware of what the 
with taken out because you you know you basically trust your prosecution services or your legal advice or, or whatever. You know, I browsed through my statement, the contents were there, nothing was added that I didn't disagree with, uh, and I therefore signed the statement. What do you think now? In hindsight, um, the statements um, should have been left intact. The amended statements were sent to the West Midlands force who were investigating the South Yorkshire police. They knew they'd been altered, but didn't know how much, and didn't ask. Well, there was a degree of trust in this, and was that naive or not? I think it was a perfectly natural reaction that you could trust the force, even if it hurt them, to come forward with the truth. Um, and not to expect what is now being suggested, that, that there was a huge, um, if not conspiracy, certainly attempt to, to move the whole evidence away from South Yorkshire and, and load it onto the fans. But the point is, shouldn't a police officer worth his salt investigating another police force have found out what was going on? Well, I think you're looking at it with wisdom of 2020 hindsight, aren't you? A month after the disaster, Lord Justice Taylor's inquiry began in Sheffield. Chief Inspector Norman Bettison ran a liaison team, briefing South Yorkshire police witnesses. But the judge wasn't convinced by some police evidence, particularly from the most senior officers. The official inquiry into the Hillsborough disaster says the police and Sheffield Wednesday Football Club must shoulder most of the blame for the tragedy. Lord Justice Taylor's report was damning. He found that the main cause of the disaster was overcrowding, and the main reason for that was a failure of police control. Failing to block off the tunnel after opening gate C had been a blunder of the first magnitude. My reaction was that I cried. I'd heard so much about drunken hooligans and uh, I tried to defend my son, he wasn't like that. So I just thought, well, perhaps it'll all end now, perhaps they'd stop. Um, but of course they didn't. Prosecutions of senior police officers were expected to follow. At this crucial point, South Yorkshire Police produced an allegation with the potential to destroy any case against them. It came from this first visit to the Hillsborough Stadium, three days on from the disaster, by Lord Justice Taylor and Chief Constable Deer. Their driver was a PC from South Yorkshire. He told colleagues he'd heard the two in his car agreeing right at the start about blaming his force for what had happened. We've identified their driver. He's former constable Mark Lewis, seen here on traffic duty in 1990. At about this time, senior officers began hearing rumors of the conversation he'd overheard a year earlier. Mark Lewis has told Panorama that while he felt at the time what he'd heard was inappropriate, he didn't think it was worth taking any further. But then, a full year on, it was suggested he go and talk to his boss, Norman Bettison. After speaking to the recently promoted Superintendent Bettison, Constable Lewis felt it only right that the record be put straight. He made an official report. Mark Lewis alleged Lord Justice Taylor had said, I suppose you realise that to give this inquiry any credibility, we have to apportion the majority of the blame on the police. Chief Constable Deer allegedly replied, I suppose we do. A year later, that overheard conversation had become a serious allegation. It landed on the desk of South Yorkshire's new Chief Constable, Richard Wells, who just replaced the recently retired Peter Wright. How many times in your career have you seen the law lord and a chief constable accused of conspiring together? One, this case, and that's why I reacted so seriously to it. 
It didn't cross your mind that the police in South Yorkshire under pressure may be up to something here? No, it didn't. No, it really didn't. No. Um, the thought was, this is a significant allegation which needs looking into, and I am not the person to look into this. Chief Constable Wells sent the allegation to the Director of Public Prosecutions, just as he was deciding whether to prosecute following the Taylor report. Now the DPP had a serious allegation against the judge himself. Lord Justice Taylor and Geoffrey Deere were interviewed. What was Lord Taylor's response? <laughs> as he told me, his response was one word and, and pretty colourful, um, as, as was mine. The suggestion that two people, one the Chief Constable of the biggest police force in the UK outside London, the other the man who shortly to become Lord Chief Justice, had never met before, get into a car in front of a witness say they're going to cook the books, is utterly ridiculous and actually very annoying. Mark Lewis declined to take part in this programme. He told us he stands by his statement. But the DPP decided it wouldn't, in any event, have been grounds for action against Lord Justice Taylor and Geoffrey Deere. Six weeks later, the DPP made a much bigger decision on Hillsborough. The Director of Public Prosecutions has decided not to bring any criminal charges against the police or officials in connection with the Hillsborough football stadium disaster. Chief Superintendent Duckinfield was allowed to retire on medical grounds. Neither he nor anyone else would be prosecuted for their part in causing the disaster at Hillsborough. Allowing those extra 2,000 people into those already overcrowded pens, for me, that is gross negligence. So how on earth prosecutions didn't follow from that, I'll never know. The Hillsborough cover-up went wider than the police. If, like me, you'd been there, you'd have seen the chaos, the lack of a proper emergency response. But those who pointed it out would find themselves ignored or disbelieved or slapped down. Liverpool fan Dr John Ashton was one of them. The morning after the disaster, he went on television. The whole thing from beginning to end had incompetence running right through it, the organisational arrangements. And I think that it's time we started to ask questions about accountability. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr Ashton. A very distressing morning. Dr Ashton was an inconvenient witness, a qualified doctor who'd be taken seriously. Behind the scenes, he says, attempts were made to shut him up. In public, at the Taylor inquiry, his reputation was attacked. Lord Justice Taylor asked me when I went back to Liverpool, did the media contact me or did I contact the media? And the implication of that was that I was seeking publicity myself. Lord Justice Taylor tried to imply, you know, I wasn't a proper doctor, I was a public health doctor, didn't see patients, didn't know what I was talking about. Lord Justice Taylor's report damned police failings but praised the other emergency services. Yet there were claims the ambulance service had almost completely failed to provide emergency treatment. An inquest should have been the best chance of finding the truth. But the coroner, Stefan Popper, made a decision which would leave the performance of the emergency services largely unquestioned. He accepted medical opinion that all who died that day were beyond help by 3.15. But could lives have been saved? They weren't all pulled out of the pens dead. So what then happens is nobody kills them after that, but what can kill them is the failure to actually address their injuries quickly and appropriately. The mother of one young victim always maintained her son, 15-year-old Kevin Williams, 
was alive well after the coroner's 315 cutoff. He imposed the 315 cutoff point because when the surge came, it was meant to have took them all. You know, passed out within a minute, dead and brain dead within four, so many minutes. So he said by 315 they'd all be dead. And it didn't matter what time any medical people arrived. West Midlands police were assisting the coroner. They had all the pictures we're now looking at. And they showed Kevin Williams wasn't pulled out of gate three until long after 3.15, at 3.28. Kevin was laid on the pitch, police officers immediately trying to revive him. Soon after, Kevin was carried across the pitch and there's a photograph, taken after 3.30. But was he alive? I remember shouting to everyone to pick him up and get down here with him. You know, you're looking at people everywhere and you're thinking, obviously my instinct was, this lad needs help. I've seen people dead before and I know that there would have been a colour change. His colour looked okay, he looked, he, he was pale. You know, I could see that he was alive. The West Midlands Police also had a photograph of an off-duty Merseyside policeman, Derek Bruder, trying to resuscitate Kevin. He told me what he'd done for Kevin. And I said, was my son alive? And he said, well, if you say, finding a pulse with the first two fingers, and he lifted his hand up like that, with your, with your right hand, um, if that means he was alive, then he was alive. But this photograph wasn't timed, and PC Bruder couldn't be certain when it was taken. What he did remember was an ambulance arrived at the ground as he tried to save Kevin's life. Derek Bruder wasn't called to give evidence at the inquest. Instead, his evidence was outlined to the coroner by a West Midlands police officer. He only mentioned two ambulances coming onto the pitch. And he said both of them had arrived before Kevin Williams was carried across the ground. This seemed to undermine PC Bruder's entire account. There were a number of anomalies in his evidence, including a problem with the entry and exits of the ambulance. It didn't quite tie in. Nobody's actually picked that point up, but there is a difficulty with his evidence, as far as I remember, with regard to the timing. But there was no problem of timing. There weren't two ambulances at Hillsborough. There were three. And West Midlands Police knew that. They had the third ambulance on video, and they'd taken the pictures to the crew, to Tony Edwards. They had a video set up, they had photographs, and they had laid out photographs as well. And, um, and it was them who said to me, I want to show you your vehicle coming on the pitch at 3.35. And they showed you it was 3.35, they told you? Oh no, absolutely. They had all the information. But that information wasn't given at Kevin Williams' inquest. The third ambulance wasn't mentioned at all. Now, we can confirm Derek Bruder was right all along. We found footage shot moments after Kevin had been carried down the pitch. Those nearby see Kevin needs help. And then we just see PC Bruder rushing towards Kevin, exactly as he described. It's after 3.30. We can reveal Derek Bruder has now complained to the Independent Police Complaints Commission about the way his evidence was dealt with. Long before the families arrived for this, the final day of Britain's longest inquest, it was clear that there was going to be an emotional conclusion. The Hillsborough inquest came to an end in March 1991. The verdict on all of the victims was the same. 
accidental death. The Hillsborough families were shattered. We will continue. We fortunately have had a lot of sympathy from the nation. It's an uphill struggle, as you can appreciate. We've had to take on every part of the establishment. I was utterly devastated. I really thought we stood a chance. I thought maybe we would get somewhere. But, and I was absolutely, it was despair for me. Anne Williams never collected her son's death certificate. She always refused to accept the verdict of accidental death. They used to say, you're right, Anne, but you'll not beat the system. And I used to say, well, and he said, that they're wearing you down. And I can always remember saying, well, I'll wear them down before they wear me down. Despite all the inquiries, the truth about Hillsborough remained buried. I think at that point, there was a sort of consensus in the English legal system that that's your lot, Liverpool families. You've had three very powerful inquiries here. You've had the Taylor inquiry. You've had a years long investigation by the DPP. You've had the longest inquest in criminal history. That's your lot. Time to put those papers away and let's move on. The Liverpool families wouldn't move on. They'd been let down by the law, now they turned to politicians. After the Labour election victory in 1997, over 40 of them travelled from Merseyside to meet the new Home Secretary. He made a promise. We owe it to everyone touched by this tragedy, but above all, to the families of those who died, to get to the bottom of this matter once and for all. Jack Straw, the Home Secretary, saw no need for a new inquiry, but he believed that wouldn't be publicly acceptable unless it came from an independent source. So Mr Straw proposed a limited review of any fresh evidence by a judge. In what he now says was a purely factual query, the Prime Minister Tony Blair asked, why? What's the point? The documents reveal that neither the Home Secretary, Jack Straw, nor the Prime Minister thought anything would come out of it and that they didn't really expect the inquiry to produce anything other than that which had already been produced by inquiries which had produced nothing. There's a bit of hypocrisy there, isn't there? Yeah, I think there was. How does that make you feel? Bad. Jack Straw appointed Lord Justice Stuart Smith to carry out a scrutiny of the evidence. He also told the judge the Home Office had seen nothing to justify a full-scale inquiry. The families feel you marked Stuart Smith's card from the beginning. Well, that's not marking his card, that's just telling the chap the truth and explaining to him why I wasn't establishing a full-blown inquiry. There was no secret uh, about this. That the but you system... tell them your view in advance? You tell them, well, I, wasn't telling him, I wasn't telling him my view in advance. I was asking him to conduct an inquiry. But I was telling him of the scepticism of officials. So eight years after Hillsborough, South Yorkshire police were again in the spotlight. Many of their officers who'd been there had been badly affected. Inspector Clive Calvert was one of them. I picked him up and as far as I remember, he cried on the way back. I do remember him uh, coming in, sitting in the chair. He had a drink, but he went to bed very early and he didn't talk about it. He looked absolutely devastated. In preparation for the Stuart Smith scrutiny, Inspector Calvert was asked to brief his chief constable at the ground. The inspector took the chance to speak out. He said he'd worried for years that police witnesses to the Taylor inquiry had been coached and officers' statements altered. Inspector Clive Calvert said very clearly that he felt that there had been an element about the changing of statements which had not been as innocent as I had believed it to have been. Inspector Calvert retired after 38 years' service and has since died breaking ranks on Hillsborough 
had been difficult. He did say to me, I found a word with the chief constable. And he also said, I think that'll be the end of my career. I don't think I'll go any further with the police. Something to, the, to that effect. After investigating Inspector Calvert's concerns, an assistant chief constable from South Yorkshire reported to Judge Stuart Smith. He said Clive Calvert had been wrong about police witnesses being coached and he'd misunderstood the process around which statements had been taken. Inspector Calvert, he said, had been naive. I can't explain that. Uh, um, it, it's not something that I would immediately agree with either saying or doing. He was an experienced inspector, both operationally and in football. Mr Calvert? Yes, absolutely. He wasn't naive? I, I, as, as you put that to me, I, I can't understand understand why it was said. He'd never been described as naive before. In fact, he'd always been described as a very astute uh, man with a great deal of integrity. So f for that letter to say that is uh, quite upsetting for the family. And to be honest, ridiculous. <laughs> When he published his report in February 1998, Lord Justice Stuart Smith ruled that altering police statements did not amount to irregularity and malpractice. The Home Secretary agreed. The overall conclusion which Lord Justice Stuart Smith reaches is that there is no basis on which there should be a further public inquiry. Les and I did everything that was expected of us. We played their game. We put in police complaints. We wrote to the coroner. We asked him questions. We did a judicial review. It was all nice. We wrote to all the prime ministers. And at the end of the day, it got us nowhere. Yet again, the truth about Hillsborough was buried. You described it as a thorough inquiry, you were entirely satisfied with his conclusions. Yes, and I thought it was a thorough inquiry, and that I was satisfied with his conclusions. And you learn. If I'd known then what I know now, I would have come to different conclusions, but I didn't. You could have known then, couldn't you, if you well, looked harder? Quick. I might have been able to. It's a matter of great regret that I didn't look harder, and I'm sorry that I got it wrong, uh, and I can't turn the clock back. That makes me so sad because that's another 14 years of my life that I've been made to look for the truth when it was already there. I mean, that is a national disgrace. The 20th anniversary of the Hillsborough disaster was marked by a memorial service at Anfield. It was a turning point. The Culture Secretary, Andy Burnham, came to express the government's sympathy. We can at least pledge that 96 fellow football supporters who died will never be forgotten. The crowd of 30,000 made it clear that was no longer enough. Under pressure, the minister made a big commitment the government would break the rule that official documents have to remain secret for 30 years. People kind of thought, is this possible? I didn't think it was possible, but I think that he knew that whether he was bouncing his government into it or it was done with agreement, his government was going to have to respond to this. The Hillsborough families had lost confidence in government and the law. They insisted on choosing people they could trust to look at the official records. By the time the independent panel published their report last September, it was a new government that finally said sorry. These families have suffered a double injustice. The injustice of the appalling events, the failure of the state to protect their loved ones, and the indefensible wait to get to the truth and then the injustice of the denigration of the deceased, that they were somehow at fault for their own deaths.
the Hillsborough report showed the 315 cutoff imposed by the coroner was wrong. An analysis of medical evidence revealed that given proper treatment, more than half the 96 who died might have had a chance of survival. My son and 95 innocent Liverpool fans did not die in an accident. They were unlawfully killed at the least. In December, the accidental death verdicts were overturned and the High Court ordered a new inquest. The original coroner, Stefan Popper, told Panorama it was not appropriate for him to comment. Anne Williams was now gravely ill. You might not see the end of this now. No. But you've, you've won your victory. That's what I thought. My son did not die in an accident, neither the 95 with him. So at least I've got that, we've got rid of that. Because the accidental death verdict used to really, really upset me, because it let them off the hook, didn't it? Anne Williams died last month. Yorkshire Ambulance Service NHS Trust wouldn't be interviewed by Panorama. They say they'll cooperate with any new legal inquiries. My involvement in Hillsborough has always been a torture. It's been life-changing. And I always find these interviews difficult. I feel they're necessary so we get this true story out. And I'm unshakable on that. I know what the situation was, how we dealt with this badly. There are two new investigations into Hillsborough, one into who might have caused the disaster, the other into allegations of a police cover-up. Both South Yorkshire and West Midlands police say they'll cooperate with these inquiries. The match commander, David Duckenfield, declined to be interviewed by Panorama while the new investigations were going on. Sir Norman Bedison became Chief Constable of Merseyside and then of West Yorkshire. He resigned last year, saying the Hillsborough investigation had become a distraction. He declined to be interviewed. For the Hillsborough families, it's not over yet. People don't want to be fighting this cause anymore. No, Nearly true. 24 years later, it's taken its toll on a lot of families. A lot of people aren't here anymore to see you it through to the end. If people are proved ultimately responsible, I'd like to see them charged with it. Because everyone else in the country is subject to the law, and they should be as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to happen? No. Hillsborough was an avoidable disaster. What happened here was obvious. But some of our most important institutions, the police, the judiciary and government allowed it to be covered up. That's the truth about Hillsborough, a dark truth buried for a generation. <laughs>